Well, we are so glad you are with us today. But before we get to formal worship, I want to take a moment to talk to you about our nation and the state of our nation. Uh, because I think it would be a little weird to act like nothing special is kind of going on right now in our nation. If you want to just jump straight to worship, you can just go to the time that's there on the screen. I'm recording this on Thursday, and at this point we don't know who the president is. So I don't know what it's going to be like when you are watching this. But on Facebook today, I saw some of the most hateful posts I've probably seen in the last four years. You know, this idea that just a little bit more than half or just a little bit under half of our country are just absolutely terrible, horrible human beings. And that kind of outrage It's not, it's missing the whole point. It's, it's missing the deep picture of what's going on here. So I don't want to talk about the candidates. I don't even want to talk about politics, but I do want to talk about us, we the people. Since so many people did come out to vote, which was awesome, that means the results we're seeing give us actually a pretty big picture of America, and it shows that a little bit more than half, or a little bit less than half, of your fellow Americans are on the other side. And so we can be tempted to think, how could anybody in their right mind vote that way? They must be hateful or stupid or a dupe. Uh, so there are two possibilities for that question. So if you find yourself like really wondering, like, how in the world could half our country vote the other way than me? It seems to me there's only two possibilities. The first one is what I just said. And that is exactly what the far left thinks of conservatives. They must be hateful or stupid or dupes or all three. And it's exactly what the far right thinks of progressives. They think progressives must all be hateful, stupid, and complete dupes. Well, if really 50% of your fellow Americans, 50% of your neighbors really are that, it's all over. And America is over. Because America was designed around the idea of a country full of individuals, not clones. So if 50% of the nation are clones, it's all over and you can just forget it all. Might as well start looking for another country. Well, that's one possibility, but there's actually another possibility to explain this. But we don't like to go to that one because it's uncomfortable. It actually makes us feel bad. and. And who wants to feel bad? It's one that requires us to actually swallow our pride. And who wants to do that? So, here's my big suggestion for number two. A little more than half, or a little less than half, of your fellow Americans who are actually very kind, and caring, and informed, and empathic, and hardworking and patriotic think you are dead wrong. Dead wrong on the policies, dead wrong on the politicians to get us. Not like they think they're, they might not think their politician is great or they might think they're great, but for me it's always been choosing the lesser of two evils and they just think you're dead wrong. Like they, they think you're really missing the big boat. That's the other possibility. And we don't like that possibility, because that means we might have to learn something. It, it means that we actually don't see all that's going on. So which is it for you? Alright, here's how I understand it. Remember your Easter box? This is actually going to come in handy. So if you still have one of these, go and get it. Now what I'm about to say is going to sound, I guess, blatantly obvious to those of you who are smarty pants. But I'm a simple man, and this one thought actually helped me this week when I felt like pulling my hair out. Ready? This is not about sides. It's about cute. It is not about the good guys and the bad guys and a line in the sand. 
that divides them, it's about looking at a cube from different sides. So, how many sides are there on a cube? That's right, six. If you have a cube, right now, I can't see the side that you can see. In fact, from where I'm looking, it doesn't even exist. How many sides can you actually see at one time when you're looking at a cube? If you try this, I think you'll find it. You can only see three. Right now, I can only see three sides. What if there were six major issues or concerns for Americans, and each one was on a side? Listen to these six issues that Americans care about and see which ones of these you agree with. Number one, the rule of law must be upheld. We need law and order. The Constitution must be upheld and honored even if it gives you the results you don't like. We should be a nation of principles. Number two, there is still racism and other kinds of prejudice in this country and things have to change. And sometimes you have to get loud and to fight to make people uncomfortable in order to get things to change. Number three, we want the smallest government possible because the bigger it is, the more power it has, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Number four, we should all pitch in through our taxes and have a big enough government so that the most vulnerable and the most needy have the most basic life necessities and they have an opportunity, a real opportunity, to succeed. We should be a nation of mercy and compassion. Number five, we should maximize freedom and reduce regulations so those who are willing to work hard and come up with brilliant solutions are rewarded more than those who don't. Freedom of speech and all the other bills of rights are what is most important. We need equality of opportunity, not equality of outcomes, because we'll never have equality of outcomes because we're all different. Number six, we need governmental oversight and policies and regulations on large corporations and wealthy individuals to protect the smaller and the weaker and to protect the environment, because again, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, how many of those would you agree with? Hopefully some. Well, which ones are more important? Aye, that's the rub. You see, I think we could sit down with people on the other side and talk about basic concerns. Like, what are the things that you're really concerned about? Not, not the actual law, not the actual rule, uh, not the actual politician, because those are all symbolic. And symbols mean different things to different people. Rather, what is it that you most want to see? What is it that you most want? Don't you believe that 90% of your fellow Americans want liberty and justice for all? Don't you believe that 90% or more of your fellow Americans really want everyone in America, everyone, to have freedom and opportunity and fairness? So my, my analogy breaks down because this assumes all the sides are equal. And I'm not suggesting that all lists of priorities are equal. I, I think if you wrongly prioritize some of these things, you could end up with disaster. But you see, there's such a difference between thinking, oh, we actually do agree about a lot of things we want to see. We have very different sets of priorities. You think this thing is the number one thing. I think that is the number one thing. If we could begin to look at it like, I'm not standing on the other side of you. I'm seeing the cube from a different side. Doesn't that help? It really helps me. But, but the hard part about this is that it means that I need to be willing over to, to walk over to your side and learn from you. To understand about those sides that maybe at this point I can't even see. And it's not even two sides, right? Think about all the other parties. Think about the minority parties, like the Libertarians and the Greens and the Solidarity Party, right? Like all of us are kind of looking at this thing from all these different angles. What if we thought about it this way? What if we had the humility to say, look, let's talk about first concerns. Forget policies. Forget politicians. What is it that you're most concerned about? 
we're not going to come to agreement probably on what the priorities should be. And we're not going to come to agreement about what the solutions are to get to where we need to be. But if you knew that the vast majority of your American neighbors actually pretty much want the same things that you do at core, they just disagree about how to get there, wouldn't that be encouraging? So I don't know who's winning, but I'm completely at peace. It's not that I don't have a preference, but the world is neither going to fall apart nor turn into utopia, depending on who wins this election. That is not the big issue. The big issue is us, because we and our attitudes are what's being reflected in our politics. Not a side cube. I can live with that. I hope you can too. Let's love each other and love each other well. Good morning and welcome to Leverington Church. We're so glad you're with us for worship. We believe that keeping the Sabbath and worshiping God is a crucial habit to hold on to during these uncertain times. So please join us now for our first song as we sing out loud our praises to God.
Please pray with me now. Lord Jesus, in the beauty of your world, we are thankful for all you have done for us. We t come at this time and bring before you things in our life where we adore you. And we confess that so often we do things wrong. We don't thank you. We don't acknowledge you. Hear our confession. And I am so thankful, as we all are, for all that you do for us every day. Hear our praise and our thanks. And Lord Jesus, we have many needs. We lay them before your feet. Thank you for hearing us. Amen. Please join me as I join brothers and sisters around the globe today in declaring the truths that stand for all time. And as we say the Apostles' Creed, let's not say it by rote, let's say it from the heart as our own creed, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning we have a few announcements. First, Operation Christmas Child. This ministry is a chance for you to pack a shoebox full of fun things, turning it into a Christmas present for a needy child somewhere in the world. And believe it or not, we are already almost at the end of our Operation Christmas Child season, so you have to act this week if you want to be part of this beautiful ministry. Go to our website, and click on the Operation Christmas Child icon to get all the information you need about when you can stop by the church to pick up a box, to return a box, and all the other details. Please do join us in this beautiful effort. And then coming up, you're going to have another opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus to hurting people, this time right here in Roxborough. On Saturday, December 5th, we are having a food drive. And you can drop off non-perishable goods for our local food pantry called The Table. You just pull up to the parking lot with your food in a bag, and we will pick it up curbside. This is actually a fun time to catch a glimpse of other church members, and it is a great way to contribute to some local family's Christmas. So, put that on your shopping list. Food for the food drive. We also want to support you in these trying times. Do you need your church family to lift you up in prayer? If so, just go to our website and tell us what it is. And our prayer team will surround you with prayer this week. Finally, today we also want to give thanks to God for the lives of our friends in our Leverington Church family who are having birthdays this coming week. And if we don't have the date of your birthday, let us know at the email shown. So, happy birthday, Karen, Jane, Sonata, Belosi, Lavanda, Linda Joy, and Brother Chris. May God bless you richly in the year ahead. And as we move forward together in worship today, we're now going to take our offering. In these trying times, our church remains strong exactly because so many of you have been so faithful in supporting this community financially. Thank you to all of you who have stuck with us through thick and thin. 
And if you're not a regular giver, but you would like to help keep this ministry on the air, you can make a one-time donation right now by going to the website shown. Together we are building the future of our church, and we believe that God has great things in store for us in the months ahead. Lead me to the cross where 
darkness has to bow Confusion has its final hour. Well, I am so glad you are with us as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of 1 Thessalonians. And you might ask, why do you do that? Like, why do you do these kind of messages? And, and, and why should we listen to these people rather than people of our own day? Well, we should listen to people of our own day, but the reason we have to listen to them is they were witnesses to the crime. In other words, imagine you're watching the evening news and something has just happened and everyone is sitting around pontificating all their opinions. And then they say, now we're going to go to Joe, who is at the scene of the event, and he's going to tell us what's really going on. That's what these writers are. They were there at the scene where world history totally changed. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the writers are either people who actually witnessed it, first-hand witnesses, or they interviewed first-hand witnesses. And so they can bring us the news, the good news. And here's the thing, the God that was at work then is the very same God that is at work now, which means that we can encounter that God through these ancient words. And so my prayer is that you would be willing to be open this morning, open to the possibility that the maker of heaven and earth wants to speak to you uh, not to speak to people generally, not to give some general guidelines to the world, but to speak to you personally about your own life and things you're dealing with in your own life. Because that is why he has given us this word. So this morning we're going to be in chapter 4, starting in verse 1 and going to verse 12. Listen now to God's word for you. Paul begins in verse 1 of chapter 4. But finally, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So note first, they were instructed. They were instructed because the ways of God are not always obvious. We are all products of some particular culture, and every culture will have some morals and values that line up with the will of God, but other morals and values that do not live up to God's best for us. In every culture, some of God's ageless commands will seem strange, old-fashioned, extreme, or superstitious. Not because they are, but because we are creatures of our culture. We assume that whatever feels normal to us must be right, and that whatever feels strange to us must be wrong. But often it is our preconceptions, our own prejudices, that are wrong. Notice he calls them to live to please God. So let me say something very obvious. It matters to God how you live. Your lifestyle matters to God. It is not that we have to obey all these laws and be perfect followers so we can get into heaven. No, being adopted into the family of God is a free gift to everyone who will have it. To all who will bend their knee and say to God, not my way, but your way, not my will, but your will be done. But if you are part of God's family, you ought to live as if you were a member of God's household. Out of love for God and gratitude for his love and care of me, I should want to strive to live in a way that delights God and brings honor to his name. And note that Paul thinks the Thessalonians are already doing this. But nobody is ever 100% holy. It's like a journey. They've already started on the journey of discipleship and are becoming more and more like Jesus, but Paul doesn't want them to stop where they are and settle down and say, okay, we've gone far enough, we'll settle for this. When the best vistas and the cleanest water is still up on ahead. 
And so he says, yes, you have already given up many of your bad habits, and you've taken on many good habits, but the work isn't over yet. And note, Paul is saying that the teaching you're about to hear is by divine authority. In other words, he's saying, you shouldn't listen to me because this is my own opinion. What we're talking about here is what God himself actually wants. This isn't about our traditions. This isn't about our religion. This is about what God, your maker, wants for you. Now, obeying God's commands, some of them are easy to obey, and some of them are not so easy to obey, right? It's easy to obey commands where we're naturally kind of oriented that way, or it just makes a lot of sense to us. Like, of course I would do that. But then there are commands that are harder because they go against our desires and our cravings. Well, what are the desires and cravings that we shouldn't do, and therefore God's commands about those are harder to obey? Well, I think us living in our cultural moment is very similar to what it was like for those folks living in that city in their cultural moment. So verse 3 says this, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. So imagine this. Many scholars think that this church of the Thessalonians was only a couple of months old. So imagine a bunch of people in their late 20s uh, who are all friends. They're all drinking buddies. And, and then they become Christians. And they're all in it together. And at first it's awesome. Like, yeah, God and forgiveness and mercy and grace. And I love you, man. Yeah, I love you. And then their coach, Paul, comes along and says, all oh, that is awesome, but there's even more. And you're like, yeah, that's great. What else is more? Well, some of it involves self-control. Oh. Well, that's all right, man. I'm tough. Bring it on. Well, it's self-control and restraining yourself in the area of sexuality. Oh. How do we know this is all true again? <laughs> See, I think, they're, I think they're a lot like us. This isn't something a lot of us want to hear. So, what are the big themes here? First, that what I do with my body really matters. That what is natural is passionate lust towards anything that moves. But that those who know God are called to a higher standard. That we should exercise our will and restrain our passions, go beyond what is natural. By the way, this is how all society and civilization is created, by choosing to live unnaturally, by which I mean ruling our desires rather than letting our desires rule us, which is the natural way. It's about choosing a disciplined life, and that is exactly what moves a person forward. It is exactly what creates culture, because culture is about agreements, about restraining ourselves, like we're going to live together in this city, which means I agree I'm not going to break into your house, and you agree you're not going to break into my house. Well, what is that? That's self-control. That's self-discipline. That's restraining yourself. It requires discipline to keep within any agreement or law. That is the whole point of a law or an agreement, to restrain us from doing what we feel like doing. In particular, Paul is focusing here on the kind of self-control to restrain from sexual immorality. The Greek and Roman cultures were much, much more promiscuous and, and really stood in stark contrast to this monogamous idea of the Jewish culture of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. For example, listen to what the Greek statesman and orator of ancient Athens, Demosthenes, wrote in 4 BC. Mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines for the daily care of our persons, but wives to bear us legitimate 
children. So the Thessalonians had grown up with that culture, that mindset. You know, sex out of marriage is, is really no big deal. And in fact, there were multiple religions in that city, and some of these religions were really kind of oriented around sexuality. In fact, some of them had temple prostitutes. So think about how hard this was for these new Christians. Like, man, this is a hard deal. Like, this is a lot harder than I thought. Suddenly, Christianity didn't look all that attractive anymore. And though we're not quite sure, we think that what was happening was Paul realizes that there are people in the church committing adultery, and it's got to stop. He feels like he needs to speak up and say, no, this is not compatible with the Christian life. You have to choose. And so he goes on in verse 6. In verse 6 he says, And that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we've already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. So in verse 6, in general, this is how Christians should act. We shouldn't try and wrong or abuse our brother. In this particular case, we think he's referring to you know, one brother committing adultery with another brother's wife. And if you've been a Christian for a while, then just like the Thessalonians, you know the teaching on sexuality. And basically what we're saying is sexuality is not a recreational sport. It's a really big deal. It's, it's got a power far deeper than we can see. It, it's like fire or water. It's so primal. And you think about fire and water, they can either keep you alive or they can burn you to death or drown you. That's how powerful sexuality is and it has to be handled the right way. And so when we pursue uh, sexuality outside of marriage, we are wronging the image of God in the other person, even if that other person wants it. I mean, this is beyond what consenting adults want. This is about the image of God in people and God's way of living that he's calling us to. And note Paul is saying that, that when we commit sexual sin, it's not that we're just breaking some religious rule. We're actually denying or rejecting God himself. Man, that's a pretty big deal. And notice Paul doesn't say that He's pointing the finger at them and saying, you know, you sinners. He, he, he uses the word us, like he's in this with them. He knows how hard this is. He struggles with it too. And Paul isn't saying you're bad if you have strong sexual desires or strong sexual feelings. And you're not also bad if you have sexual thoughts come into your mind that you really didn't ask for, that you think are really inappropriate. We are all sexual beings who have this raw, animalistic drive in us, some of us more than others. And you may feel guilt if raw sexual ideas come into your head that you didn't ask for. But he is saying it is your job to set up appropriate boundaries and build fences for yourself to restrain your behaviors to within the fenced-in space outlined in Scripture. So you shouldn't feel guilty if inappropriate sexual ideas pop into your head, but you should feel guilty if you intentionally cross the fence, for example, by the behavior of turning to pornography. That is a choice. That is a behavior. Or intentionally putting yourself in a situation where you're set up for failure. Like drinking too much with someone you find sexually attractive who is not your spouse. So today, how are you doing in this area? Are there any fences that need to be mended in your life, in your behavior? Do you need to have an honest conversation with the Lord about this today? 
Now, this pursuit of purity is totally countercultural. Christian sexuality could make you look like a weirdo to your friends. Are you willing to look like a prude, to look like a goody two shoes, to look like someone who has hang ups in a culture that is totally hung up on sex? And what about all the alternative sexualities that are all around us every minute in our culture and on our screens? What about the ever growing uh, list of letters? describing alternative sexual orientations. Isn't this Christian idea of sexual purity the very thing uh, that creates hatred and prejudice against those who are different and other? Well, look at the very thing that Paul says in the very next verse. Verse 9, Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. So we're to have strong sexual ethics and we are to love our brothers and sisters. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, which includes those who are different from us, those who might have a different sexual orientation than we do. And notice that that phrase, brotherly love. Let me pronounce that phrase for you in the Greek. Philadelphia. And notice it says you've been taught to love. By who? By God himself. When God gets a hold of you, love for your fellow man naturally follows. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the preciousness of every person's life the importance of their own hopes and dreams becomes obvious. People stop being two-dimensional objects and start becoming celestial beings created in the image of God and deeply important to Him. This theme, that new birth in Jesus, becoming a Christian, results in this new way of being, having this true, sincere love for others, and especially for fellow members of your church community, is a primary theme of 1 Thessalonians. This is why Paul is always addressing them as brothers and sisters, because Christians are to have this brotherly love towards each other. In fact, Paul uses this phrase, brothers and sisters, 19 times in this short letter. By the way, uh, the repairman is fixing the furnace downstairs, and Ruth is doing a Zoom meeting and planes are flying overhead. So I apologize for all of that stuff in the middle of all this. You know, what I just read about brotherly love, sisterly love, it all sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? And and, and in the abstract, it just seems so wonderful. And then you realize it includes actual people that you can't stand. Um, The people you think are the problem, those are the very people that I'm too give brotherly love to. I recently heard a gay man give a talk about how he dealt with people who considered his sexual behavior sin. And he was talking with a lot of people who supported him and supported his orientation. And this is what he said to them. He said, empathy is not endorsement. Empathizing with someone you profoundly disagree with does not compromise your own deeply held beliefs or endorse theirs. It just means acknowledging the humanity of someone who believes differently than you do. I totally agree with that. I think he's exactly right. And whichever side you come down on on these social issues, I think this approach applies equally. As a Christian, I should feel no compulsion to comply with the morals of my culture or to give in to social pressures or to say things are okay that I don't think are okay when I'm called instead to pursue an eternal set of values from God himself. But I should feel compulsion to feel empathy towards people I might disagree with toward every human being I meet. I don't get to write them off or dismiss them as a freak just because their sexual ethics are different than mine. 
I never have the right to say, oh, you're one of those people, and then reduce that person to nothing more than their morality. Listen to this again. Empathy is not endorsement. Empathizing with someone you profoundly disagree with does not compromise your own deeply held beliefs and endorse theirs. It just means acknowledging the humanity of someone who believes differently than you do. This is part of brotherly love. So I hope you find this both convicting and freeing in terms of how you should live your life personally. But in our communal life here in Philadelphia at this moment, we're not doing so well at this. The left and the right are failing at this miserably. We are nowhere near living up to the name of our city. The amount of hysteria and fear-mongering if the other side wins, the amount of correcting and lecturing, the amount of canceling anyone who dares to disagree with you, the amount of reading the worst possible motives into anything the other side says or does, the amount of being busybodies, calling people out on anything we don't happen to agree with, this is not brotherly love. This is not empathy. You know, being upset over the latest outrage of the other side is a great way to avoid getting on your knees and repenting for the ways that you have failed to show empathy to those on the other side. It's a great way to avoid it. Empathy is not endorsement. It is the heart of Christ. Who set you up as the grand evaluator, the judge of the universe, who told me it was my role to stand in judgment of my neighbors and point out exactly how they have failed to live up to my omniscient political insights, to proclaim that it, if they do X, it means Y, when actually to them it means Z. It means something totally different to them. So today, do you need to get down on your knees and ask God for forgiveness and ask Him to soften your hardened heart? I'm thinking maybe I need to. And remember Paul's posture. He's like an encouraging coach. He's saying, look, you're on the right track, and that's awesome. Keep it up. Don't settle for where you are. There is more growth in Christ waiting for you ahead. And then moving on to verse 11, now the rubber meets the road. He says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. So Paul has been emphasizing our need to really be all about brotherly love, you know, this outflowing, outgoing love towards other people, and, and how could that ever be bad? Don't we always want more of that? Well, we also have to make sure that our love and concern for others doesn't turn us into spiritual busybodies. You know, poking our noses in other people's business. So here in verses 11 through 12, he gives us three ways to balance this command to love. He says to live a quiet life, not seeking to always have the attention or the spotlight on us, to not draw attention to ourselves, Second, to busy ourselves with our own affairs, our own job and home. Third, to actually work with our hands, to focus more on doing and being than on spouting opinions. Now, here's a little cultural background that will maybe give you some depth as you look at verses 11 to 12. Back in that time, there were rich patrons and poorer clients. And the idea is if you didn't have as much money, uh, but you wanted to kind of hobnob with the wealthy and rich, you would attach yourself to somebody who had a lot of power and money. And they would help you out financially, and they would give you ec economic opportunities, and they would introduce you to the right people. And in return, um, you were like their cheerleader. You always uh, talked them up. Um, if there was an issue that they wanted to go a certain way, you tried to influence it. Uh, you were in their corner, you were their man, uh, you were loyal to them, 
Uh, you were always lifting up their honor, always talking about just what a great person they were. So this was called patronage. And Paul's saying, that's not what we want for you. Jean Green writes, the counterpoint to patronage was labor, to work with your hands. But manual labor was generally despised by those of the Greek aristocracy and by those who aspired to a higher social status. To work with your hands was something that slaves and artisans did. Therefore, to call those who had lived as clients in this church to engage in manual labor, to gain their living, was shocking. Although the apostle promoted benefaction to those in true need, he opposed the dependency of clients on patrons. So if you ever wondered where that phrase, the Protestant work ethic, came from, a lot of it comes from this verse. You know, in our own city today, do you know people who think manual labor is below them, uh, that it's not dignified? Do you know people who'd rather be dependent on others or the system rather than get their hands dirty with manual labor? Paul says, well, fine, but not if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian and you're able to work, you need to work. Because the lowliest job, a minimum wage job, is full of dignity. If you bring your dignity as a child of God to that job, the job doesn't define you. You define the job. Well, how about that idea of leading a quiet life and minding your own business? Well, minding your own business certainly means don't be a busybody. But it can also literally mean mind your business, practice your own trade. In other words, take responsibility for producing your own income. Okay, well, what about that leading a quiet life and not being a busybody? Does that mean that Christians should never protest? Never go out into the streets and fight for social change? No, but I think it means we should be very slow to. That we should never do it for virtue signaling. Thinking we are virtuous for jumping on a socially acceptable bandwagon, but meanwhile not lifting one finger to solve the actual problems. We are to work with our hands. We are to do the actual, messy, unglamorous effort it takes not to bring about a utopia, but to make things just a little better. And when you do that, when you are a hard worker rather than a loudmouth, when you carry your fair share of the load and don't take advantage of the system or your neighbor, when you are profoundly humble and offer empathy to all, even those whose views you think are totally insane, well then what will happen? You'll gain the respect of the people around you. Now, not everyone, right? Some people are always just going to be jerks. But the majority of people are going to respect you. Who wouldn't want to be around someone who's kind and humble and soft-spoken and hardworking? Like, who wouldn't want to be around that person? And that's who we're called to be. Because, you see, when you live this way, the vast majority of people will respect you. And then they might even be open to hearing what you have to say. And then you might even be able to share the gospel with them the good news with them, just as Paul has shared it with us. You might be able to introduce them to something that is wonderful and freeing and hope-filled and life-affirming and joy-producing, this good news of the gospel. You guys, let's not waste another moment trying to fit in, trying to win approval, um, fretting about what people think of us. Let's not waste another minute on this soap opera of the latest outrage that the media presents to us uh, be because that's how they make money because then we click on it. I mean, let's not live for our handlers. Let's not live for our patrons. Let's live for Jesus. Let us take our eyes off the shiny objects that our handlers are always trying to get us to focus on so that we don't focus on what is truly important. And what is that? To pursue the good and the true and the beautiful that are found in Jesus.
Let us pursue brotherly love. Let us remember that empathy is not endorsement. Let us decide to pursue the good and the true and the beautiful found in Jesus. And then let the chips fall where they may. Amen.
飞翔。